please welcome the amazing Charlie Harari. What an honor to be here. Thank you so much for always being such an incredible, incredible audience in this. HLA is a light into the entire community and to Sarah and Peter. What an honor that you so deserve and you are such an inspiration to all of us. You know, tapping into greatness is such a great title because it's what we all want. We may look different, we may act different and talk different, we may have different ways we express ourselves, but what makes every one of us exactly the same is that what we want for ourselves is to tap into our greatness. Parents know this when their kids come home and say, Mom, Dad, I'm just not great. I tried math for three minutes and I can't do it. I went to school and tried to play sports and I didn't get picked. And as a parent, you're going, no, 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 don't give me that. I'm not good stuff. You're just starting your life. Uh, 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 you got to play for greatness because it's what me and you want. So we want our kids to have it. So how do we tap into greatness? What's the moment? If I can put it under a microscope and ask, what is the one second that you go from not to greatness? What is that second that it feels like when you become someone that breaks ground into greatness? So that's what I want to talk about tonight for a few minutes. The moment where you tap into greatness. One of our greatest challenges for achieving greatness is that we misuse our greatest tool. We have an arrow in our quiver that we should be using to become great, but we misunderstand it. And because we misunderstand it, we give up the opportunity to tap into our greatness. And what is that? That is inspiration. We misunderstand inspiration. You know that feeling of inspiration? You ever get that? Where you hear that song, or you go to that dinner, or you hear that speech, or you go to the wedding, or you go to the funeral, and you come out and you go, it's going to be different now. That's it. I got it. I'm losing weight. I'm getting fit. I'm getting an A. I'm organizing my life. I'm making money. I'm becoming the husband. I'm becoming the dad that I was. And you're so committed. You wake up in the morning, and like as if like you have a new found energy. You go to the gym, and you're like, this is amazing. I feel great. You pass on dessert. You organize your desk. You come home, and you're, you come home early. You sit with your wife, and you listen. Aha, uh -huh, absolutely. Tell me every detail about your day. No, I care. Then you go to your kids. Sure, I'll read you Goodnight Moon. Two times, ten times, fifty times, red room, big balloon, whatever it is, absolutely. And you go to bed, you're like, wow, this is amazing. Where was I my whole life? Like, this feels great. Right? You wake up the next morning and it's amazing again. You go to the gym and then you don't want dessert. You make yourself a healthy dinner. And then you think such, you're calling your mom and you're talking to this person. You're getting involved. You come back, you're like, it's about time I felt this way. It's just green light, green light, green light. Right? You ever get that feeling? And then the third day or the fourth day, but for sure by the seventh day, that alarm goes off, right? You know, you know, you know how like we're, we're all heroes when we go to bed at night, you know the feeling? You're like, I'm going to wake up early, I'm going to do my taxes, run a marathon, write a book, and then and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll get to work like two hours early, right? The alarm rings, like, nah, I'll snooze, I'll just, I'll go to the gym later. You know, snooze, I'll just, I showered yesterday, it's okay, right? Snooze, I'll, you know, I, I hated that job no matter what it was, right? And you wake up in the morning and that feeling, you know when you get up in the morning, by the way, when you, you get up in the morning, it's like you're breaking up with your pillow, you know what I'm talking about? You turn around, you're like, goodbye pillow. I miss you so much. I had plans tonight, but I'm canceling it. I'll be here at six o'clock and we'll go to bed 12 hours, me and you. And like something goes away. And like, you, you know what, I'll take that dessert, just give me one more, you know, just bring the whole tray over, I'll die tomorrow. You come home and then you snap and then you go back to you play, you're playing with your kids and you do the whole move where you put the iPhone behind their head and start scrolling just in case. You may miss something. And then you go to bed, you're like, what happened? I can't do this. Anyone feel that way? Inspire, two steps forward, you're killing it. And it goes away, two steps back. And then I get inspired and round and round I go. And then all of a sudden, 2, 10, 15 years later, I got the same resolutions every New Year's. Every Rosh Hashanah, same thing. What is going on? How come we can't execute on being inspired? And the answer is because we don't understand what inspiration is and what it's not. So what is it? So we're lucky because we are in the period of time right now in the Jewish calendar that is there for inspiration. 
If there was ever a period of time that we have all year long that has to do with greatness, it's right now. And the Jewish calendar, Judaism, is not a commemorative religion. We don't do things because we did things because we did things. We're Jews. We're way too busy for that. There are things to do and food to eat and money to make. We can't just commemorate all day. But if we do something, it's because there's energy that's taking place right now behind the veil of the physical world. The Jewish calendar are outlets that we can plug into to change ourselves. Remember, my son once asked me, Daddy, can you explain to me voltage? And I said, here's how it goes. You take your charger. Like, when I grew up, I had things to plug in. Now all you plug in is chargers. You take the charger, and I plug it in the wall. You know what's amazing, by the way? What's the number one thing you have in your house right now? What is the most valuable thing you have in your house right now? It's your charger, isn't it? You can have 100 phones in the house. How many chargers? One charger. And everyone's like, that's my charger. That's my charger. Hand my phone. Look at my initials on it. We have the same last name. Of course it's your initials on it. You ever get that feeling, by the way, where you go to charge your phone? Because why, why are charges so important for? Because two generations ago, what was the greatest fear somebody had? Was the lack of food. What's the greatest fear that we have today? The lack of battery power, right? Because God forbid I walk out of that house and it goes to Apple's like, bing, you got that low battery because 20%. And you're like, what if it dies in the middle of the day? And I can't get Waze and all my pictures and everyone I know and I can't shop. Like, I'm just never going to find me. And so the feeling you get when you put charge your phone, you ever plug your, your phone in? You go in the morning, you're like, how am I only on 15%? And your, 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 your wife's like, well, I, I, I went to charge my phone and I saw that you had 82%. I only had 81%. I'm like, that's a rule now? You can just pull out your charger because of power? Every period of time in the Jewish people and the Jewish history is to pl plug into something. And right now we're in the most unique period of time to plug into greatness. What is this period of time? Right now we're in between two holidays, Passover and Shavuot, leaving Egypt and getting the Torah. Now, getting the Torah is one of the most cataclysmic days of our history. Jewish wisdom is in that moment. And it's hard for us to realize this because we're sitting in America right now, and we are the products of modern values. But it's hard if we were sitting around, and you saw some of the classes here, in Rome on Sundays, and on Sundays they went around and killed people, or in Greece when they practiced infanticide, or Babylonia or Persia. What we're sitting through right now is the product of a society based on Judeo-Christian values because of the day that God gave us the book. And everything that happened in Passover, all the plagues, all the laser light shows was just for one reason. Because God wanted Moses to take a Jewish people that didn't know him, that were slaves for 210 years, and introduce himself to people. And take his people and walk them through Egypt and walk them over a mountaintop and give them wisdom and say, go to humanity for the rest of humanity and civilize them. Show them value of life. Everything that happened was for this one moment of what's upcoming now, the holiday. And the questions that everybody asks is, why are we waiting from Passover to Shavuot? Why was there even a gap of time? Moshe shows up. He sees the burning bush. He comes down to Egypt, and he goes, hey, guys, great news. I saw God. He was in a bush, and it was burning. They're like, yeah, sure, whatever. They go, that's okay. You don't believe me? Sit back and watch. And there was 10 incredible plagues. What were the Jews doing for those 10 plagues? They were like, holy cow, this guy's amazing. Very creative and has all the resources that he wants. And they come out of Egypt after 10 plagues and they are proud and they are strong and they're a nation. And God goes, you think that's good? Wait for night activity. Are you joking me? And he brings them to a scene. They're like, what are we doing here? There's no boardwalk. There's no hotel. Like, what are we doing here at the scene? And God goes, oh, wait. Boom. And the Jews walk through a sea. They come out the other side and they go insane. They point up to heaven and they say, this is God. They turn around and they go, I believe, I believe. Thank God in heaven, I believe. God's awesome. He's the greatest regional director possible. He needed to get Jews to believe in him. Ten plagues in a split sea and the Jews all believed in him. If you were God's program director, what would you do next? If I was God's program director, what would I do? I'd say, okay, guys, great news. Tea rooms open all night. You are Jews. Shuttles, 6 a.m. to Mount Sinai. I'm in real estate for a living. You know, my first thing they told me when I got to the real estate farm, I'm going to give you three letters. You get these three letters, you're going to be successful. You forget them, you won't. A, B, C. Always be closing. The whole goal of Egypt was to get them to believe in God. They come through. They believe in God. They stand by the sea. If you were God's program director, what would you do next? You would say, tomorrow morning, Mount Sinai, sign the deal. I'll give you the book. Passover 
should be the day before we get the Torah. How it happens? Remember the story? They wait a day. They wait a week. They wait six weeks. Maybe ways wasn't discovered yet. They keep on waiting. For what reason? What was happening? God was trying to raise money for Mount Sinai. He was looking for like a donor pledge. He was sending out the invitations. Why in the world would it take so long to get them up that mountaintop? Why wait? What in the world was the purpose of having the Jews hang around? So I'll tell you a quick story. So a few years ago, I had to visit a friend of mine in New Jersey. I don't love going to New Jersey. I'm from New York. Because if you know New Jersey at all, here's how it works. You can go from New York to New Jersey in two hours or in 15 hours, depending on one little bridge called the George Washington Bridge, which works on the whims of the former governor. So I go down to Jersey, and I pass by all these small little towns, and I pull off to the side of the road to my friend's town, and I get into town, and as I look around, I realize, wait a second, something's so weird. Everything is dark. Remember a couple of summers ago, they had these rolling um, blackouts? So this is a hit. I'm in a small little town in New Jersey, and I look around, and everything around me is dark. I'm like, ah, oh, this is like how horror movies start, like lost in New Jersey in a blackout. They eat the guy from New York. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I pull my car to the side of the road. I had been to my friend's house more than once. I know my way around. It's not a big town. I can't see from my car. I can see from the street. I start walking in the street, looking for my way to go. Nothing. I'm this block, that block, nothing. All of a sudden, I hear that grumble in the sky. You know that little grumble in the sky? That when you leave the house and you go, is it going to rain? Mm, not sure. And God's like, come on, just two more steps. Let me bring you out till you make a decision that you can't go back on because you're a guy. Uh-huh, come out. And usually your wife's like, take a coat. You're like, honey, it's fine. God's like, perfect. Don't listen to your wife, too. This is amazing. One, two, flood. And now I'm stuck in Jersey in the darkness, flooded, and I got nothing. And I run to a block, and there are all these stores, and I'm hiding under the awning, literally feeling bad for myself. And in the middle of the storm, I, he I see the most incredible thing. I see lightning just strike. And this dark area of Jersey just lights up for a second. And then it goes back to dark and raining, and then all of a sudden, strike. And I say to myself, hey, wait a second. I've been here before. I've been on this block before. It's going to strike again. And when the lightning strikes again, I am not going to miss my chance to get lost in New Jersey. So I'm paying attention, and I'm going to see where I can go. Dark, raining, strike. That looks familiar. And I start walking. And it's dark, and it's raining, and I don't care because I know what I saw, and I'm not going to get stuck in the same place when that lightning strikes again. And all of a sudden, lightning strikes. And I'm like, mm, there. And I start walking there. Two, three, four, five times later, I'm literally on the block of my friend. I go right up into his house, knock on his door, and as his mother opens the door, my luck, the lights go right back on. That's my life. <laughs> what is inspiration and what is it not? And why do we misuse it for we think that inspiration is the time in which we grow. I feel inspired and I'm off to the races. I'm, this is different this time. I gotta lose weight and get in shape and I'm off to the gym. I wanna be a better husband and I'm doing the right things to be a husband. I'm gonna be a good dad and I'm right now off to, off to be hanging out with my kids. I'm gonna eat different and talk different and pray differently because as soon as I feel inspired, I think that's my signal to go. We think inspiration is the green light of our lives. And when we feel it, we jump on the horse and off we go. But here's the problem. Inspiration is not the time in which we grow. Inspiration is the time in which we see. We live a life where we buzz and beep 24-7. There was once a time where you left work, I heard someone told me that, was, that isn't around anymore, that there was once a time in the history of the world, I think like 200 years ago when you left work, you left work. It doesn't happen anymore. Every aspect of our lives is constantly moving and moving and the treadmill of life has us going so quickly that we never once slow down and say, what am I doing this for? What do I really want out of my life? What do I really want to be? And then something comes and stops the treadmill. 
a wedding, a funeral, a song, a dinner that just takes the treadmill and shuts it off. And in the moment of slowing down, we take a breath and go, wait a second. That's not the father I thought I was supposed to be. That's not the mom I want my kids to remember me by. That's not the Jew that I am. That's not how I eat. That's not how I talk. And in the moment of raining and darkness, there's a crack of lightning. The job of inspiration is not to keep us going. It's for us to turn around and see who we really are. Do you ever get inspired? You never say, I couldn't be. You know what you say? That's who I am. That's who I really am. You know when growth happens? In the darkness. You know when greatness happens? In the rain. You know when you become great? When the alarm goes off and you're not getting out of bed and you drag yourself out. When you sit in the room and you're talking to your family member and all you want to do is check whatever email that you're not really important about but you think you are, that you're on your hip and you hold everything back and look at your spouse and all you're thinking is, this is my soulmate, more important than my pocket. Growth is always in darkness. You want to know why Sarah and Peter Weintraub are, uh, Weintraub are great? I'll tell you why. It's not because they got turned on by an H class. It's not because they sat in the room and someone lit their fire. You know why they're great? Because when the H class ended and everyone was like, that was amazing, back to my life, they said, whoa, no, 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 no. We keep on moving. But we can't be inspired every second. I know what I saw, and I'm not going to be in the same place when lightning strikes again. Because nothing in the world is greater than progress. And you want to know when you start to tap into greatness? The first time it hurts. The first moment after inspiration. You see, that's why God had us wait in the desert for all these weeks. You know why? Because he runs the show. He gets human conditions. He says, here's the deal. You're inspired? Mazel tov. I just rocked the show in Egypt. Hello? Who's not inspired when you walk through a split sea? Like, big deal. I'm giving you a book for life. You're walking through Inquisitions. You're walking through Holocaust. You're going to land in a country in the Middle East, and no one's inviting you in. We didn't go to Israel, and they're like, oh, you're in Israel. Welcome back to your homeland. Here, everyone, Arabs, we're bringing you some hashish for dinner, and welcome to the show. Here you go. It's like, oh, you came back. Guess what? You have 15 minutes, or we're going to drive you into the sea. you got to hold on to this book through adversity, through tough times. You're going to hold on to wisdom in rain and in darkness. Here's the deal. I inspired you. Big deal. I want you to sit in a desert. You sit in a desert, and you climb the mountain on your own. Because if you can keep on going in that desert with nothing, when you get to the top of the mountain, I know you'll be mine forever. We are right now plugging in, for those that want, into the energy of true greatness. Knowing who we are and never allowing the lack of inspiration to take us there. That's how we tap in. And what I leave you with is the following. What's the thing you always wanted to do? Who's the person you always wanted to be? You become that when you push after you get inspired. Because inspiration is the gift of the lightning that only allows us to see who we are. But tapping into greatness, that's climbing the mountain in the desert. And that's what it means to be a Jew. That's what this dinner stands for. That's what Aisha Torah stands for. And that's what the honorees stand for. The Litwack family, can you imagine a family they're sitting in our midst to lose a child and take that pain day after day, darkness and rain, and climb a mountaintop to give back joy to children? That's greatness. That's our destiny. That's who we need to become. And it is my blessing that we leave tonight looking at the honorees and not saying they did great. It is my blessing that we leave tonight looking at the honorees and saying, we are all great. And we become the people that tap into the energy of our forefathers right now 
and ultimately climb the mountain to be the people that we're meant to be. Thank you very much.